Good morning. morning. (laughs) Today we'll be looking at Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through 2. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. A uh, brilliant young man questioned Dr. Henrietta Mears. Um, those of you who don't know who uh, Miss Mears is, Henrietta was a Christian uh, educator and author who made a, a large impact in the evangelical, uh, on evangelical Christianity. And she was asked by this young man about surrendering his life over to God. Now, his, he was convinced that becoming a Christian thought that this would be the destruction or the end of his personality, that if he, it would some way alter uh, him as a person and that he'd lose control of his mind and eventually he would become just a mere puppet uh, in God's hands. So Miss Mears asked him to watch as she turned on a lamp. One moment it was dark, and then she turned on the switch. She explained that the lamp surrendered itself to the electric current, and the light has filled the room. Now, the lamp didn't destroy its personality when it surrendered itself to the electric current, but kept itself. Actually, on the contrary, the very thing happened where the, that the lamp actually produced light, the very thing that it was created for. So, One of the dilemmas people have coming to God is thinking that if they surrender their lives over to God, that this means that they are somehow brainwashed and this destroys the very thing that makes a a person unique. And in, in this case, their personality. Now, we're going to talk about the uniqueness. We're not going to be talking about the uniqueness of each uh, individual person, um, but we will be talking what it means to surrender our lives to God and how we go about to accomplish this. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul's advice to the believers in Rome was to sacrifice themselves to God. Now, Paul wasn't talking about a sacrifice on the altar, like the Mosaic law, which required the sacrifice of animals, but he's talking about a living sacrifice. The definition of the word sacrifice is anything consecrated and offered to God. So, what does it mean to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice? Well, first, that the first phrase in there, the mercies of God in verse 1, this is actually a reference to everything Paul was talking about in chapters 1 through 11. So he's saying because we have received and experienced God's mercy, now we are to be living sacrifices. That is, we are to live for him out of gratitude and love. So the first point here is that we are instruments of righteousness. And the, uh, that phrase, instruments of righteousness, is actually pulled from Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 13. And this is actually uh, a correlation between those two verses. Um, it, it is, let, no, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Now, just like the analogy that Miss Henrietta gave to the young man about the lamp, see, when I pick up my instrument, that is, in this case, my guitar, and begin to press my fingers on, that, on, the, on the fretboard, that is the neck of, this, of the instrument, I don't alter its sound to make it sound like a piano or a flute. But when I begin to play 
the guitar. The guitar has now given itself absolute surrender over to me. And I haven't altered its personality in any way. So trust that God knows what he is doing when you hand your life over to him. See, I can sometimes hear my neighbors who are just learning to play guitar. You know, some of you may have heard that as well. I mean, it, at sometimes it sounds like someone just gave the, the guitar over to a monkey and you, you just hear strumming and strumming and just, it's just obnoxious noise at times. But when you give the guitar over to some, a skilled and studied musician, it no longer just sounds like random noise, but it has a cohesive rhythm to it. It has a cohes- cohesive sound. And again, God knows what he is doing. He is the author and finisher of your faith and not careless and unknowledgeable, but knows what he is doing. See, this is what it means when God says in, in Psalm 46, verse 10, he says, be still and know that I am God. And th- in the, in this, um, that is, in the context, it means cease striving. So, or, or stop trying to make this work yourself. Be still. Stop trying to run the show. You cause more yourself more pain by doing this. God says, I will be exalted among, among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Hudson Taylor said, I used to ask God to help me. Then I asked if I might help him. I ended up by asking him to do his work through me. So, the way we come to be instruments of righteousness and have a renewed life is to follow in a spirit of obedience. The Bible has a lot to say on the subject of obedience. Obedience is actually an essential part of the Christian faith. The, the two must go together. So Jesus is our ultimate example of obedience. It says, And being found in human form, he, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So for us as Christians, the act of taking up our cross, following Christ daily is the way we express our obedience to him. See, our love for God will be evident if we obey him. John chapter 14, verse 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. See, a Christian who is not obeying Christ can be rightly asked, of, asked this, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I tell you? See, the definition of obedience is this. It is to be dutiful or submissive, to have submissive compliance to the commands of one in authority. The, the, the word dutiful means it is an obligation for us to, to obey God. It's not a maybe. And the word submissive means that we yield our, our will and plans over to God. See, our, our obedience to God isn't solely a matter of duty, though. We obey God because we love him. So our experience of obedience is also the act of obedience. Uh, Know that not every time you obey the Lord or serve the Lord in an act of obedience, you are, are you always going to feel that fuzzy, warm feeling inside? See, God calls us to very uncomfortable uh, territory, not for the sake of making you miserable or that, you, you know, that he's trying to go after you or uh, he's out to get you, I should say. But suffering and sacrifice are essential to the Christian life as well as just a, uh, to um, the, all the other elements of being a Christian life. You know, just as we talked about in Sunday school, you know, those across seas who are enduring persecution, those will be a part of the Christian life and that we are sacrificing ourselves, being a living sacrifice, and that we, un- that we are to go through suffering. See, we are called to leave our homes, sell everything we own, turn the other cheek, do not store up earthly goods for yourselves, love your enemies, and take up your cross daily and follow hard after him. See, none of Christ's commands call us to a life of comfort. Every one of Christ's commands will require this of you, that you have patience, suffering, and sacrifice. I remember the first sermon I I preached, which was uh, from uh, Matthew chapter 7, which says to enter through the narrow gate or 
to strive through the narrow gate, for wide and the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many are there that enter through it. Now, Jesus said the word strive. That, that word strive actually means to live as a Christian, you will actually endure pain, suffering, and discomfort. Now, no doubt some of you have experienced this when you've gone through many, uh, you know, s- several trials, or perhaps even when you fall into sin, God chastises us, convicts us of our wrong, and lovingly puts us back on track. And if you don't believe me, read Psalm 119, where it says, the psalmist says, it was good for me to be afflicted that I, so that I might learn your decrees. See, if we are not coming to the place of obedience, then God knows how to get our attention. He knows how to get the attention of his children, that we may seek after him with all our hearts, mind, soul, and strength. And know the promises of God that he rewards those who seek after him. God is always faithful in kind. We uh, talked about our first love in, in Sunday Bible study a few uh, Sundays ago. Our Christian life is not about rules and regulations. Yes, we, in, in Scripture we are given commands to follow, but we do these things, again, out of love. The Pharisees in Jesus' time relentlessly pursued acts of obedience to the law, but were self-righteous, believing that God smiled upon them because of uh, their outward appearance and that they now had an inherited uh, place in heaven. See, our relationship with God is found not only in our obedience and in the way we interact with one another, but it is found in our quiet time with him. See, as we read his word and pray daily, this is what it means to die to ourselves. Let God speak to you through his word and you speak back to him through prayer. The way I've heard it put, um, it's uh, to guard your quiet time, is, is this. You guard your quiet time like a man who is leading his wife through a third world prison where all the guards are off duty. That is where your priority should be in your quiet time. So you will fight for your first love and you will hold on to that which is most valuable to you in this world. See, God pursued you before the foundation of the world, and while you had your back turned to him, he followed hard and long after your heart. See, this is what Paul is saying, um, was saying when he, when he said, in view of God's mercy, now offer your bodies as living sacrifices. So the next point I want to get to is that we are slaves to God in righteousness. Now, this sounds odd with that we are slaves or enslaved to God because the word slave oftentimes carries um, with it negative uh, connotation. But the word slave doesn't necessarily mean oppression or being in possession of a harmful master. So spiritually speaking, um, Paul says that no one is free. And he explains this in Romans chapter 6. He says we are either slaves to sin or slaves to righteousness. And although it sounds like a contradiction, the only true freedom in Christ comes to those who are Christ's slaves, that we are now his possession. So because we are, you are slaves to God, you, know, you now experience the products of joy and peace. And this is why the Bible refers to the gospel as the law of liberty. See, the Bible refers to us as slaves because a servant is someone who works for wages, and by his works, his master now owes him something. But the Christian has nothing to offer God in light of his forgiveness and for the death of his son on the cross. There's nothing that we can do to pay him back. So again, the, the right term would be that we are slaves to God. We belong to him. We are in his possession now. Scripture says there is nothing that can snatch us out of the hands of God. You are sealed forever in Christ. Again, although we have tremendous liberty as Christians, we are slaves to God and we are servants to all. In other words, if something you are at liberty to do because you are a Christian should offend somebody, it is better that we did not practice those things or 
at least practice those things in front of them for the sake of the gospel. You know, and uh, it has been well said that whenever the, the Apostle Paul saw a Jew around the corner, he would, hi, um, he would hide his ham sandwich behind his back. And again, in the same spirit, we should do that. That, again, we are looking out for the sake of the gospel, that we should never offend anybody, that we become servants to all. You know, I used to think because of my past sins and even though that God forgave me of those, that I still owed him something that, again, I was still in debt and a debt I had to pay off. And this, again, gave me tremendous, uh, a tremendous burden and frustration. But to do so, I would not be free. And again, you would not be free. And Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 36, whoever the Son sets free is free indeed. That means you don't owe a thing anymore. You don't owe anything to your past. God has taken care of all those things. So your master, God, has paid your debt and you are given a privilege that is beyond any earthly treasure you could ever find um, here on earth. And Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 says that we are now seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Now, there are Christians that still live as though they are still in bondage to sin. Uh, And again, I used to be one of those. Now, this happens because we don't obey God in his instructions. There is a reason for his instructions. Um, that we, uh, it's not necessarily that he is stealing fun, fun from us or that we should not be, in, you know, be able to enjoy him, but it is that he is protecting us from something and that we follow along hard and after him and that he is saving us from pain. And that's the reason for the Proverbs that we are given in Scripture. Paul says to put off the old self with its deceit and corruption and again to put on the new self with its righteousness see the way to prevent injuries and avoid pain for ourselves is to keep yourself fit now i'm not talking about being fit physically but to be fit spiritually now paul when he warned timothy of false doctrine uh, told him to exercise himself to godliness See, Paul himself kept fit through exercise. He said, therein, herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense towards God and toward men. See, when your conscience tells you something, listen to it. It's there as your friend, not your enemy. See, the reason we are to strive to put off the old self is so that we become useful instruments of righteousness and for righteousness. Second Timothy chapter two verse twenty one tells us, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. I, I like what um, um, Leonard um, Ravenhill said. He said, "Let no man think." of fighting hell's legions if he is still fighting an internal warfare. That is sin. Carnage without will sicken him if he has carnality within him. It is the man who has surrendered to the Lord who will never surrender to his enemies. See, if you are struggling with a sin in your life, you have to come to a realization that Jesus is probably not Lord of your life. You cannot worship God in your right hand and harbor sin in your left hand. There will be much stress, frustration, confusion, anger, guilt, shame, and a deep sense of hollowness. See, know that your ministry cannot move forward if you are continually in sin. The man who surrenders to God will not surrender to his enemies because he has left no room for sin in his heart. There was a story of a man who was once traveling on foot through, the snow, through a snowstorm in a strange country. He had to get to a certain town by nightfall and was somewhat overtaken by the sight of an ice-covered river. Now he thought to himself, how thick was this ice? And he, uh, Could he trust that this ice, icy river could hold him? So he began to crawl on the ice inch by inch on his belly and tapping with his fingers. So sweat began to pour from his brow that that he thought at any moment he could plunge to, his, to an icy death. And now about an hour had passed, and he had progressed about 40 feet until he suddenly stopped, heard a voice, 
turned his head and saw a man, a driver singing at the top of his lungs, driving a car across the icy river. Now, the driver knew that the lake was solid ice and his, and his faith and trust was such that he had total confidence and control of himself over the situation. See, you and I will not get very far in our ministry if we are continuing in sin, whether that be fear, doubt, worry, anger, or lust. See, we progress very little in our, and our efforts will again be go in frustration and confusion and a sense of loss. See, there's no direction for you because God cannot give you direction while you are in sin. But it is when we surrender ourselves to God, allowing him to take control of every aspect of our lives, can we push forward and with joy and peace. And eventually, we watch the fruits of our labor begin to flourish. It begins to bloom. Now, we can come to the, to the place of surrender when there is an internal transformation. When God spoke to Moses about the tabernacle, he told him how to do things to, according to a certain pattern, and he gave him certain instructions. He didn't say to Moses, do the best you can, but it actually had to be 100% accurate and the, according to the instructions that God had actually given him. Now, our surrender to God should be that of the same manner, that we don't uh, settle for just doing our best, but that we do that we give our all, that we give 100% to him. See, the definition of transformation means ch- change or renewal from a life me, that no longer conforms to the ways of the world to one that pleases God. We know in Scripture that says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. So what Paul is saying in there is that our inward spiritual transformation will manifest itself in an outward, uh, in outward um, actions. C.S. Lewis said, we are not merely imperfect creatures who must be improved. We are, as Newman said, rebels who must lay down our arms to surrender a self-will Hence the necessity to die daily. See, when you and I surrender our lives to Christ, know this, that you are not becoming a better person. You're not improving anything. See, there is nothing that you can actually improve in yourself when you become a Christian and that when you, um, when you follow the instructions of God. But you must become a new kind of creation entirely. And this is what the point of Scripture So we don't read God's word to become a better person. Jesus calls us to crucify our person and put on a new self, which is Jesus Christ. See, to say we improve ourselves would be to try and hold on to our selfish desires and yet try to worship God at the same time. See, again, this cannot be done. You're worshiping God in your right hand and harboring sin in your left. But again, praise God for the the transforming work that he gives of us. You know, I look back at my old self and who I used to be, that the person I once was, it was a lonely, dark, broken, and pitiful person, and there's no way that I would ever want to go back to that person. And again, there's nothing I can improve on that, but again, crucify the flesh, put on Christ, and walk in a newness of life. So the first step in having an inward transformation is to pursue God's word. And we have mentioned this in in, uh, Bible study today, I love what the psalmist says in 119, verse 162. He says, I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. See, there was a a story of a young man who once received a letter from a lawyer stated that his grandmother had left him an inheritance and to his astonishment, he had um, been given $50,000 plus. Also, a note that said, my Bible and all it contains. Now, the youth was delighted to receive the money. However, he knew, he thought he knew what the Bible contained. And because he, was, he wasn't uh, into religion, he didn't bother with opening the Bible. He set the Bible up high on a shelf and left it there. The young man gambled away the $50,000. And over the next 50 years, he lived as a 
as a pauper, that is, uh, scrapping for every meal. Now, finally, he became so destitute that he eventually had to move in with his relatives. And when he had cleaned out his room, he reached up onto the high shelf, remembered that the Bible was there as he felt his fingers on it, and with trembling hands, he dropped the Bible, and the Bible flung open. And then within each page of the Bible, of the page, of each page, there was 100, a $100 bill. The man had been living, uh, scrapping for food because of his prejudice. He thought he knew what the, uh, what the Bible had contained. See, sin may attack the Christian from all sides, but those who, whose steps are in God's word prevent sin from having any dominion over them and over their heart. But be, just because you read God's word, this doesn't necessarily um, mean that it, it's a pill that you pop in your, hand, in your mouth and that all your problems go away for sin. Again, this is not what it means to live a Christian life. The rest of the battle, battle is fought in a prayer, and so we pursue righteousness through prayer. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 through 15 says, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. See, God prompts his people to pray and then acts in response to their prayers. This, um, things actually happen or don't happen because of our prayers. This doesn't mean that God is a divine butler and never should we treat God as a divine butler, that he can be manipulated through our prayers and that we, um, he, um, we ask anything and he beckons to our, uh, to our calls. Instead, God reveals his will to us by his word and again and works in us by his spirit that we know what his will is and pray according to that will. And this is what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. In responding uh, to our prayers, he accomplishes both his will and ours in the process. And again, he involves us in that. Surveys show that more than 90% of Americans pray daily, and no doubt that they pray for wealth, health, and happiness. They also pray that, again, that grandma would get well, and, but, but eventually when she dies, they again become disillusioned and bitter. This is because they are, their understanding of prayer is, uh, is lacking. The Bible says that sin actually will keep God from hearing our prayers, and if we pray with doubt, we will uh, not get an answer. See, the, if you want to be heard in your prayers, remember these four things. That is, the first one is pray with faith. And the second one is pray with clean hands or a pure heart, meaning that you've confessed your sins before God. The third one is pray genuine, heartfelt prayers rather than vain repetitions. You know, we can get into that habit of praying for this, uh, and re- it almost sounds like we're rec- reciting something. But again, if you want to learn how to pray, this is, read God's word, be in God's word. This is how we learn how to pray, is that we are in God's word. And the fourth one, make sure you are praying to the God revealed in scripture. And again, this goes back to Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that we pray according to as well, that we discern what God's will is, that we pray according to it. J.C. Ryle said concerning prayer, he said, what is the reason that some believers are so much brighter than hope? Um, are so much brighter and holier than others. I believe the difference in 19 cases out of 20 arises from different habits about private prayer. I believe that those who are not eminently holy pray little, and those who are eminently holy pray much. See, the last point I want to get to is once we pursue God in his word and prayer, we now have separation from worldly passions. And that is from ourselves. First Peter chapter two eleven says, "Beloved, I urge you as strange, uh, excuse me, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul." 
And in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Do not love the world or the things in this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. See, the term world in the Bible can refer to the physical universe and, and earth, but in this verse it refers to the humanistic system uh, that is at odds with God. And so the world often applauds sin. You know, Hollywood encourages us to envy one another's possessions and foolishly compare ourselves to, uh, to the rich and the beautiful. <clears throat> one of the hardest things about being a Christian is that you begin to realize that your source of entertainment and places begins to dwindle down. There aren't very many things we can go to to enjoy without dishonoring God. But the more you spend time with God, the less satisfaction you even find in those things you used to enjoy, such as books, movies, uh, the music that you listen to, and, and certain habits that you used to be into. When you turn your back on this world has to offer you, know that it will, the world will try to sting you back. Jesus said that he did not come to bring peace, but he, came, but he brought a sword. <clears throat> and he also warned that if anyone comes to him, does not hate his own father, mother, wife, brother, uh, children, and sister, and even his own life, cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus isn't saying that you are to store up hatred in your heart uh, towards your, your family and friends, but that your love for God should be so great that your love for your family and friends would almost look like hate. <clears throat> See, this is the first commandment that we are to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And as much as we love, tr um, as much as we love to treasure our spouse, uh, our family, and friends, again, it should never overtake our priority. That is God being first in our lives. To put anything before God would be to break the first and second commandment, which is to commit idolatry. <clears throat> you know, op opticians now offer glasses with uh, titanium uh, frames. You know, titanium twists and bends, but again, it forms back to its, um, to its first state you know, with integrity. See, we must never compromise with God's word. And again, we should always, as a Christian, rem um, retain our integrity in God. Um, we may bend and, and be flexible in certain situations, but again, it should never cause us to compromise. You know, for years I thought that overcoming my sin meant uh, doing a routine of things, you know, such as reading my Bible, evangelizing, evangelizing, focusing on certain tasks, doing this and that to, to keep my mind focused off of sin and um, on on the things of God and, and off of sin. But I have found that perhaps the number one uh, fruit of salvation that would help me to uh, overcome sin would be this, that Jesus become most precious to me and that I look towards Jesus. You, you and I are commanded to flee sin. But again, it doesn't stop there. It says that we are to flee, um, flee sin and go to righteousness, or that is, we are to flee from sin and go to Christ. That is, that Christ should be everything to us in our lives, that we focus on him. <clears throat> you know, uh, Winston uh, Churchill noted that the nose of the bulldog is slanted backwards and that, so that he can continue to breathe without letting go. So, Again, in likeness, to get your teeth and the importance of pursuing God and righteousness and do not let go for any reason. See, let it be said of you from Psalm chapter, um, chapter 37, verse 31, the law of God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. And as a, res as a result, we will live a wholly surrendered life. You know, I, in trying to study uh, this, I, you know, I, I picked this particular passage because we, uh, of having a holy surrendered life, you know, and I, I think it is in the past that I did not understand this, and it was good for me to go to this to understand it, and that, um, you know, in my own life and battling sin. So, you know, again, it is not that we pursue all of these tasks of reading your Bible, again, and, and doing, you know, evangelizing, but again, those things are important. Those things are things we should be focused on. But again, it is when Jesus becomes your first 
priority, and that you love him each and every day, that we worship him uh, in every moment of our lives. As we uh, go out uh, this afternoon, again, this is, this is another aspect that we are surrendered to God, that God is Lord in our lives. So again, I pray that we'd examine our lives in light of being living sacrifices. If we're not coming to that place of fully surrendering ourselves, that we do so today because, again, our future as a church cannot strive forward if we are living in sin. As we look to find God's vision, God cannot speak to us if we are harboring anything in our lives. So it is for us to put off the old self and put on the new self that we can push forward and strive and to watch God at work in our lives. Let us close up in a word of prayer.